Welcome back to the Troopy Project where we're talking lights, comms, and the power, the front power setup. It's like, that's a good start, isn't it? In this episode, we're gonna have as many flies as views, more than likely. Whoa, whoa, steady on. Now, before we do any of that stuff, and before I run wires for the UHF radio and the lights, I'm gonna need to install a dual battery system first because that is the bulk of the wiring. Handle with care. After that, we'll run all the other wires as neat as possible to the roof, to the bar, to lots of different places. This is gonna be a mission. We're in the outback and that's a good reason for me to explain why I've got a dual battery system in the front. This doesn't power anything in the back. All this does is everything basically from the roof lights to the front, that's it. So with this battery system here, and with all dual battery systems, it's not a dual battery system if you can't jumpstart your crank battery from your second battery. This is a dual battery system that I've installed DIY. But what I want to say here is before you even consider that, figure out what you're going to use the vehicle for because you may need two batteries, but maybe you don't need three batteries because putting a battery here is more to do with the front end of the vehicle, winching, lights, vehicle related things, not so much a house battery. A house battery here gets too hot. You wanna put a house battery in the back. So the whole thing is I can join these two batteries while I'm winching and while I got all the lights on. I always do that and I've got the same kit in the 79 series. To charge the secondary battery, I have a BCDC 1225D, which means it's a 12 volt charger that sends 25 amps to the second battery. It actually sends 27 amps from testing it. The D means solar. Don't know why D means solar, but D means solar. I've got a solar input here, which means I can charge while I'm sitting at camp. So that'll charge the secondary battery constantly and we'll make sure that it is absolutely topped up and full because the alternator is not going to be able to do that job. So you can do a more simple setup where you've just got two batteries here and they're linked with a solenoid and then it just charges them both. If you have that set up, they will never ever get 100% charge. And that's where this DC-DC charger or BC-DC charger comes in and it makes sure that that one is fully charged. So down here, there's a solenoid that allows me to link both batteries. So I can do a temporary jump start. I can, I can also push it in and link them up so I can run the winch and the lights at the same time even. It just lessens the load on this battery because if you keep putting a lot of load on this battery, like say all the lights in the winch, you're gonna end up just collapsing the battery. So every time I start the car, link the batteries, much less stress on everything. How is this dual battery system wired up? To start with, it's a full PDP dual battery kit. The kit itself does cost $1,700. Now, to many, they'll be like, oh, that's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Let's not beat around the bush here, but it's the whole kit. You get the solenoid, you get the DC-DC charger, you get the brackets, but most importantly, everything is already done. All the wires are here, every single wire you need. So you don't need to run backwards and forwards to the shop. You don't need to spend the time making all the little wires. The instructions are pretty good. So to me, it just made sense going for this kit. But also, I am heavily involved with the research on this kit. It's been in my 79 for over nine years, the dual battery system in the 79. R&D has been done by myself in that vehicle for PDP. And that's why I'm so confident in this kit and that's why I've got this kit in this vehicle as well. How long did it take me and how easy was it? It took me a day and a bit with a lot of distractions. So if you were to take on the task yourself, I reckon you could do it in a day. Allow a solid day. I like how all the injector drivers are up nice and neatly tucked away. Tucking all the stuff away is definitely to your own discrepancy as well. I made sure that everything vital was in a nice spot and had a lot of slack on the wire so nothing's gonna be too tight on corrugations. You don't want that. It's all in, it all works. How many times have I used that before in the 79? Quite a few times actually. You find that when you have all this gear in your car that draws power, the cranking batteries, they last about a year and a half for me. Generally speaking, two years maybe for most people who have a lot of gear in their car. And when they get tired and kind of dead, that's when it's handy having that because you're not always close to a battery store where you can just throw another battery in. 
Car won't start. In the middle of the bush, late to work. If you have a proper dual battery system, that's no problem. Perfect. Off to work it is. We're just about to test the new lights on the trophy. The sun's about to drop down. We're going to find out if we're getting glare on a bonnet, which we probably are, but is it going to be a problem? Because I think we're going to throw so much light out that it's not going to be a problem on the bonnet with the two vipers on the roof. They're 20 inch dual rows. Never had dual rows before. There's a lot of light up there. Had a sneak preview of it earlier. And we've got the HDX2s on the bar, which I'm very used to from the 79. This setup should have more light than the 79. Let's go find out. That sun's gone down. It's dark enough for our test, but to give you an idea of what we're expecting out of these, let's have a quick look. Now, I might be talking a bit loud because the engine's on because these are drawing so much power, hence the second battery that we put in. And I'm holding this light so you can actually see me. So the HDX2s, they've got the ring of the LEDs in case you didn't know and the HID in the middle. So they got good distance and good spread. I'm expecting at least over a kilometer out of these to see down there. On the spec sheet, it says 1.6 Ks. The Viper bars up here, these are the brand new ones that have just been released. They're dual rows. I only went the dual rows because it kind of suits the Troopy a little bit better, but I also wanted to try something different because I've got a single row light bars on the 79, they're the old version. These are the Vipers. These pump out some serious light as well. So we should get some pretty decent spread. I haven't done all the lights around the car yet. There's a couple more lights on the bar as well, some side lights and things like that still to come. But we're just testing and how we wired them up was DIY. I'll show you how we did that too. Instead of showing you how I installed these lights, I'm going to run you through five really good tips of things that we learned along the way that's really gonna save you time and that you need to look out for. All right, let's get into that. My first piece of advice is going to be a little bit obvious to many people, and that is grab the whole harness out and lay it out, sprawl it out where you think it's going to go or where you want it to go, and then you can work out the length of wire you need to extend because the last thing you want to do is be running backwards and forwards to a 12 volt electrical store to get all the lengths that you need. So with that out of the way, oh, also part of the first tip, with your wiring diagram, make sure you understand it. And when you match up the switch, the colors of the wires are gonna be different. So what we did, we wrote down, for instance, blue to yellow, yellow to yellow, those kind of things. Because when you're installing two lights, or especially these front lights that have two lights in one with a double switch, it gets a little bit complicated, but if you write down where each wire goes, you don't have to try and remember it up here. Tip number two, make sure it's not cluttered. Last thing you want is wires coming all off this battery. So what you can do instead is get one wire, one single wire off your crank battery, and make sure you run them off your crank battery. Go to a fuse point, bring that around to the opposite side where there's not a lot of wiring and cluttering, and set up your switchboard over there or your fuses over there. Find a nice neat spot and make up a bracket yourself for all your fuse holders. That's what we've done right here. It is so neat. This is also a five set bus bar. So you might as well future proof it and that's what we've done here as well. So that way I still have two more inputs to run either side lights or rock lights or fans for the intercooler or something like that. So. It's just a good idea to do that. Also, while you're there, if you made a little bracket for that, if you have other relays for other things, find a nice neat spot that you could merge everything to one area. Then you don't have wires going absolutely everywhere. And where you can, run your wires out of the way, like we've done in here. Inside the quarter panel, for example. You do have to take the positive around, which you spoke about already, but with the negative or the earth, you don't need to come off the battery terminal. You can come off 
any of these points over here. You can just earth it off the body, earth it off the chassis, earth it off the bull bar, as long as there's a good connection. And that leads us to the most important tip, in my opinion. When earthing your wires to your lights or whatever it is, don't put everything to the same earth point, especially if it's on a painter section of your panel. So on most vehicles, and I guarantee on yours as well, there will be heaps of little factory holes that you can put a bolt to. Those holes are great for earthing things too. If you're gonna do that, use as many different earth points as you can. Because what happened to us, we put the HGX2s and the roof lights on the same earth point. And when we ran the lights, it couldn't pull enough current through it and the lights just gave up. We thought we actually blew fuses, but we didn't. So after moving and separating it to two different earth points, perfect. Running harnesses through. There's an easier way. If you're going through the firewall, get a bit of wire, run that through first, but make sure you run it through the grommet, not around the grommet like the previous owner did. These factory grommets usually have some blanks in there that you can use for accessories, which is perfect. I have three on each side, six in total. That's pretty good. Get a bit of wire, run that through first before you do anything. Once you've established where it's coming out and you're happy with it, tape the wires to the back of it, but do a little hook with the wire so it hooks into the wire. So when you're pulling it, because it can get a little bit tight, especially when you pull four wires through a grommet, it can get pretty tight. Silicon spray is your best friend here. And obviously a lot of electrical tape, make it as tight as you can because the less thickness you have, the easier it's gonna slide through. And you'd be surprised what you can get through those tiny little holes. And my final tip, so you probably got more than five tips there, bonus tips then, is to take your time. Just please take your time. Sheaf everything, shorten wires where you don't need really long bits. You don't want all this roll up, curled up stuff. Extend the wires properly, use dodge plugs, definitely heat shrink solder. Don't twist and tape, don't cut corners because in the long run, you're gonna end up with a vehicle fire. <laughs> I can tell you that from visual experience, not me experiencing it, but someone else numerous times, no names mentioned. In terms of glare on the bonnet, it's definitely there but the amount of light is punching out onto the road and the way I've angled them, it's no issue. It doesn't bother me as I'm driving. Let's put the Troopy up against the 79 and we'll see which one has more light. We're at the end of a six day trip. We've got the 79 on this side, the Troopy on that side. Let's go Troopy lights on. That's only the top lights. 79 lights on, all right, 79 lights off. Now let's get everything on the Troopy on. Yeah, that's freaking bright, man. That's hurting my eyes. Everything 79 on. Okay, now 79 high beam off, Troopy on. That's Troopy, Troopy off, 79, that's 79. It's clear as day which one has most light, but either way, they both got a shit ton of light. Troopy for the win. Flash on, flash off, flash on, flash off. <laughs> it may look like I'm still in the outback, but I'm in fact in the studio. Green screen, gotta love it. Lights, now for people watching this, am I conveying to you that you need roof lights and bar lights? No, 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 no. You, you don't. If you just have those bar lights, you're gonna have enough for most situations. Those roof lights are just extra. I, I like having a lot of light and they actually do help me in the bush to find camp or find a track or find what's going on and to really illuminate it. Even on the highway, I will use all those lights combined. It really does help me, I feel. But should I have a electrical problem and I can't get the roof lights, well, I'll be happy with the bar lights, I mean, on the bull bar. And should vice versa happen, I can get by. But if you could only choose, or if I could only choose one set of those lights, it'll be the HDX2s on the front because you get two and one. You get the HIDs and you get the ring around, which is the LED. So you get the spread and you get the spot. But those roof lights on their own, they're actually not bad either. They're, they're pretty f***ing bright, actually. Whoops. Yeah, we're just about there, mate. Round the outback and the best way to test your new UHF it's actually take it for a decent run where you get dust and you gotta have a big gap between you. So that's exactly what we're doing. So I've put an XRS 330C in the Troopy. Just quickly showing the components that we're gonna install because I didn't go for the XRS 390C, I went for the 330. Now this is a small compact unit that doesn't have the speaker in it. it does come with a handset, but this isn't a GPS handset. So what I've got, is a GPS handset which works with this unit. So that way you can save space and save money on the smaller unit. Therefore, that's what I've done because this is gonna fit nice and neat up inside the vehicle. You'll see that in a sec. All the wiring stuff is in here. 
This is the antenna. I'm also going for a 2.1 dBi antenna again. It's the same size as on the 79. It's gonna go on the roof though to give me that superior coverage. I reckon I'm gonna get better coverage on this vehicle than the 79 and there'll be a reason for it. Use the Cat6 cable from there to the back of this and then this can plug into there, which means I can put that anywhere in the vehicle. Now that's the only place I haven't quite decided where to put it yet is the handset. Where I thought I was gonna put it, I don't wanna put it. So getting a headache thinking about it. UHF comms wiring diagram, how we've done it. What they don't tell you in the instruction manual or the accessory stores, they don't tell you about running the cables past all high current. And what can actually happen is interference on your radio signal because you have a high current cable running right next to your communications cable. So they are shielded, but they can only stop so much. So a big high current cable or a couple of high current cables, especially if they're coiled up in certain areas and you go and pass it, it's gonna cause a magnetic field and it's gonna cause potential interference with your radio signal. So, we've got nothing in here at all to do with the radio. It's powered from the dash and the wire goes independently up the A pillar on the passenger side, up into the roof cavity and then follows the roof track all the way to the end where the antenna is. So that signal is not compromised by anything and it is so clean. And this prevents the following potential interferences. LED lights, HID lights, alternator, radio, other high current cables, general interferences from the engine. Often you hear your convoy comrades, they will have interference when they're talking to you on the radio. When you're driving, you've got a bit of a whine. I think you've got a power cable, is that what we established? Close to it? Yeah, pretty much, mate. Um, it definitely sounds like EMI or electromagnetic interference that I've got. Um, the, the pitch of that feedback is sort of very closely related to the engine rev. A whine from anything really, like could be like an electrical current whine, and they change from wherever you're accelerating or if you're parked up, or even a reverse camera can interfere with your signal. So there are so many little variables that can potentially happen if you run it through the engine bay. So I just strongly suggest if you're gonna install a radio, keep it from the dashboard back. They don't need a lot of power to power them. You can always run the power from here in and connect it to your radio, but just don't run your antenna cable into the engine bay to your bull bar. However, if you do wanna run it to the bull bar because that's the best spot you wanna put it, or it's convenient, then run it on the side Smoko, run it on the opposite side of where your high current power is. Generally, it's the opposite side of your battery. As you see, I've only installed one radio. In the 79, I have two permanent radios. I don't feel the need for it in the Troopy, and I probably didn't need to have two radios in the 79, although it is convenient to have there. It was more of my tag along tour days, which are over. I don't do tag along tours anymore. I'm so busy doing YouTube videos, thanks to you guys. <laughs> Make sure you subscribe, by the way. So I would suggest to people, if you are wanting to have two radios, don't invest in two permanent fixed radios. Invest in a good permanent fixed radio, and then the rest of the money you're investing into a radio, do it in a really good handheld because you can now take it out of the vehicle as well. And your passenger can give you directions, and you can go for a walk, still talk to people. It makes more sense rather than having three radios. So it's like the smallest compact version you can get. It doesn't have the speaker in it, but you can mount it anywhere you like. And I mounted the antenna onto the roof. Now that's probably the easiest install I've ever done. Installing it to that was painful because you gotta go, it's, it's just a whole different story going to the roof on that car. When you got a roof conversion, oh man, the installation is so much easier. We're gonna test out the comms, but what we're also gonna test out is I've got the GPS handset which plugs into the 330C. We've worked out how to get the app working. So we've got like GPS location. Every time someone does a call, we can actually see where they are. So we're gonna give that a crack now, actually pay attention to it. And I've got my stunt driver in the 79. I'm driving the Troopy, so let's get to it. Stunt driver is going. Nothing like 40 degrees out in the outback. Lots of flies. It's all right in here though. Maybe we should cancel that trip because of the flies. Should we cancel that trip because of the flies? Sure. You guys nearly did this morning. All oh, right, it's coming through here. Northeast, 366 meters. You're not very far away yet. No, it's saying it's uh, 437 meters. Okay, There's definitely something wrong with the 79 antenna because you're coming through crackly already. Yeah, yeah, I reckon we uh, did something when we might have hit a tree branch. Mate, last time I lent you the car, you hit a bloody emu. 667 meters. 
We can see your dot on the, uh, on the app. Call in again. Radio check. Ah, okay. Look here. That was the last one. I'm just coming up to a fallen over tree. Okay, I'm going to wait till I get to that point and see if there's a fallen over tree. Yeah, we're just about there, mate. Fallen tree. Right now, and that matches pretty close to where you dropped it. Yeah, you're coming through that and clear it at five. I'll see why you drop your speed. I didn't think stunt drivers drop speed. Yeah, but we also have to uh, drive back to Perth 400 k's. Smart man. Doesn't break ankles like I do. But he does hit wildlife. Unintentional. Better make sure you hear that. And when I'm at camp, I have the ultimate, the ultimate range on my 2.1 dBi antenna. Have a go at that. Base camp. With the antenna, how did it fare out there? Pretty good, as you saw but we did a longer test on the highway and it was fine, it was as expected. Although with the 79, it was a bit of a one-way conversation because we had compromised the antenna on that one. Not my fault. And also did some long distance from the property to Torben who left early on the highway. So the range is freaking awesome. The only thing we didn't test was the range at camp, which I wish I did. But it's only gonna get better, right? Cause it raises the antenna up uh, another two meters, something like that. The app I'm still learning how to use, but it was pretty cool to see where the pinpoints were. With the distance between the two vehicles, I do just wanna point out there was a slight variation in the actual pinpoint of where the pins dropped on the app. Um, so it's, it's, like, it's not like a that down to the centimeter where it locks you in. It's like within like 10 meters, seven meters or something we found, sometimes a little bit more, but it could be the fact that when you start the transmission, by the time you finish the transmission, you're traveling 40 k's per hour. In that time, you would have traveled 20, 30, 40 meters. So maybe that's why, I'm not sure. But regardless, you will be able to find the rough location of someone. If there's a track nearby, chances are they're on that track. My thoughts here are, I did a trip once where a mate of mine, Don, he got lost, he went the wrong way. Those radio call signals with a GPS, look, had he had a GPS, then I would have seen which way he went and we would be able to chase him down a lot earlier. That is one benefit I see. If a mate of yours gets lost or if you're trying to find someone who's camping, like you say someone got there Friday night, you couldn't leave Friday, Saturday morning, you're coming in, you're trying to find your mate, you can pinpoint them with that app. That's pretty cool. You can also pre-download maps as well, which I'm still figuring out cool bit of kit. Oh, the only thing is, if you do want to have all that uh, technology in your hand to see where people are, um, you need to encourage your mates to get a GME as well. It doesn't work if someone else has a different radio. So you're all going to have the XRS units for it to work. So that's what I'm doing, encouraging my mates to get one as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Trippy Mods. And if you really are getting into it and you watched this far, I suggest you subscribe because there's more of this content coming and even better, more travel content with the Troopy once we get it done. I just need that suspension. I need that done once I put all the weight on the vehicle. So I'm just hanging for it to drive properly. It drives like a bag of bloody marshmallows. It's so soft and squishy, but no clearance. 